This video is brought to you by pinesandmaples.ca, where you can find all sorts of great Canadian products made by Canadian creators. Enjoy! Unlike the crowd at Barkerville, which was made up of prospectors of chiefly Great British and Chinese extraction, the population of Fisherville in 1864 was predominantly American. The wild boys of Wild Horse Creek, many of whom had cut their teeth in the rough and tumble world of the California and Colorado goldfields, were notoriously rowdy. One incident which serves to illustrate the anarchy that reigned in the early days of the Wild Horse Creek gold rush is the shooting of Thomas Walker, an event described thus by one of the CIBC posters at Fisherville. The in the early days of the rush, before the colonial authorities had arrived to assert British sovereignty, Fisherville was a fast and loose town. As some men toiled for a pittance and others grew wealthy overnight, tensions on Wild Horse Creek grew. On an August night in 1864, there was a bout of drinking in progress at one of Fisherville's finer establishments. Words were exchanged, anger boiled over, and the name-calling began. The prospectors lined up behind two men, Tommy Walker and William Burmeester, known as Yeast Powder Bill. No one know why the fight started in Charlie Fortier's saloon, but by the time it was finished, five men were terribly wounded, and one lay dead. According to the aforementioned article in the Lethbridge Herald, men named Overland Bob and Pattyside were hit on the head with handspikes during this brawl, and a fellow by the name of Kelly was stabbed in the back with a knife. Walker fired first, shooting off one of Yeast Powder Bill's thumbs, but Bill made his shot count, and Walker fell to the ground dead. Bill hightailed it out of camp, but was pursued by Bob Dorr, president of the Law and Order Committee. Dorr caught up with Bill, and aided by his six-shooter, convinced him to return to Fisherville. His wounded thumb was attended to, and he and the other wounded men were put under lock and key. An angry mob gathered, hot for revenge, but Bob Dorr and his men dispersed them by firing their guns into the air. In the democratic tradition of mining camps all over the West, a judge and sheriff were elected, Yeast Powder Bill was provided with defense counsel, and a miner's court was convened to try Bill for the murder of Tommy Walker. Conflicting accounts of what actually happened came out at the trial, and the jury of prospectors found Yeast Powder Bill not guilty for lack of evidence. Bob Dorr let Bill know that he had one half hour to get out of town, and it is told that Burmeister was gone in half that time. A few days later, Judge John Carmichael Haynes rode into camp. An inquest was conducted into the death of Tommy Walker, but Judge Haynes came to the same conclusions as the miners. British law had come to Wild Horse Creek. Thomas Walker was a young 27 years old when he fell to Yeast Powder Bill's bullets on August 6, 1864. He was born in County Donegal, Ireland, and like many of his fellow miners, had probably left the Emerald Isle to find his fortune in the gold fields of the West. In the 1960s, Mr. and Mrs. Reg Egger of Fort Steele visited the grave and noted that it was in need of some care. They retraced the letters on the headstone, and with the East Kootenay Historical Association, constructed a protective case for the grave maker. Eventually, a replica was made, and the original is now in safekeeping at Fort Steele Heritage Town. Tracked down in Ireland, the Walker family was grateful to finally learn what had happened to their long-lost relative. All trace of Tommy Walker had been lost to his family after his arrival in North America. His father made two voyages across the Atlantic from Ireland to New York in an attempt to find his son. Little did he know that Tommy had met his end here on Wild Horse Creek, buried in the lonely grave where he still lies today. Tommy Walker's grave lies at 20 feet or so from the poster detailing his demise. A plaque nailed to a nearby tree reads, Thomas Walker, a native of Donegal, Ireland, died at Wild Horse Creek, August 6th, 1864, aged 27 years. He met his death in a gunfight with Yeast Powder Bill Burmeister. Another crime alluded to by the CIBC posters at Fisherville describes the robbery of a wily gamester named Old Cuddy. One of the most popular ways to pass the time in the gold camps was gambling. One such gambler was an Irishman by the name of Old Cuddy. He ran a small store and held shares in a large placer mining company. 
Cuddy was not much of a gambler and owed money to many Fisherville residents, often refusing to pay his debts. However, as gambling was officially illegal, Cuddy's card-playing compatriots could hardly go to the authorities to remedy the situation. Cuddy had managed to acquire 1,000 ounces of gold dust, a small fortune which he planned to take with him when he left Kootenay. He kept the gold in his store under the watchful eye of a trusty guard. Late one evening, two men approached Cuddy's store and fired their revolvers. They let out a cry that someone had shot old Cuddy. The guard ran from the store to a nearby saloon to save his friend, only to find Cuddy, playing poker, quite alive and well. When the two men ran back to the store, they found the two men were gone, and Cuddy's gold along with them. There were rumors that the whole episode had been a scheme concocted by Cuddy to get his gold past the gold commissioner and the 50 cent per ounce export duty. The robbery did prove genuine, but there was little sympathy in the camp for old Cuddy because of his infamous reputation for reneging on his debts. Incidents like the shootout at Fortier's Saloon and the robbery of Old Cuddy prompted Sir Arthur N. Birch to dispatch a constable of the Colonial Civil Service to the new diggings in an attempt to bring law and order to that wild frontier. Wild Horse Creek's first lawman happened to be 26-year-old John Brown, a celebrated Irish-Canadian frontiersman who would later take up residence at Waterton Lakes, where he would come to be known as Kootenai Brown in his later years. In his journal, Brown described one of his more notable brushes with the shady underbelly of Wild Horse Creek, which took place in the summer of 1865. Three men came into Wild Horse and succeeded in passing several thousand dollars worth of bogus gold dust. It was an amalgam composed of 75% copper, 5% lead, and 20% gold. It was a very good imitation. Well, these three fellows, Kirby, Conklin, and a third whose name I forgot, these three brought in the amalgam, bought goods, and paid for them with it. They were pointed out to me at once, and I marked them as suspicious-looking characters. When it was discovered that a lot of bogus nuggets were in circulation on the creek, I went to arrest the three strangers. They were living in a one-roomed cabin, and I knocked at the door. Getting no reply, I burst open the door, and Kirby grabbed for his gun. I had him covered, and I called out to him, throw up your hands, or I'll make a lead mine of your carcass. While I was getting Kirby out of the cabin, the other two escaped. After putting my prisoner under lock and key, I organized a posse, and we were not long in locating Conklin and his pal, both of whom were also put behind bars. Following the arrest, Brown tendered his resignation from the Colonial Civil Service, unable to make a living on account of a sudden decrease in his pay, eager to head east in search of gold. He described the unfortunate sequel to the arrest in his journal. My successor, whom I recommended, as a suitable man for the job, had a streak of bad luck with the three men I left him in the jail. Among the pieces of good advice I offered the young fellow was never to allow more than one prisoner out at a time, and never, on any account, to turn his back on a prisoner. I regret to say that one morning he thoughtlessly disregarded this advice and let all three out at a time to wash for breakfast. He turned his back for a moment when Conklin put the mug on him threw his arm under his chin and held his head back, then gagged and tied him. Then they took his horse and what money he had, his clothes and his gun, and made a clean getaway. The jail was in a lonely part of the creek, and their escape was not known till the butcher called for the meat order. He knocked at the door but got no response. Returning with a blacksmith, the lock was pried off, and on entering, they found the constable bound and gagged and locked in a cell, but the cells of the prisoners were empty. A search party was organized, but no trace of the desperados was ever found. A short walk uphill from the grave of Thomas Walker is a small parcel of land punctuated by a number of equidistant coffin-sized depressions. Another CIBC poster explains that this area once served as a graveyard for Chinese prospectors who passed away in and around Fisherville during the Wild Horse Creek Gold Rush. According to the poster, Chinese miners came soon after news of the Wild Horse Gold Rush broke. They worked poorer claims or provided services to other miners. White miners seldom honored Chinese claims. In fact, Chinese miners often could only secure rights on the ground previously exhausted by other miners. The Chinese founded and maintained this. 
their own Chinese cemetery. In this ground, the Chinese buried those who died far away from home, performing their traditional burial rituals. However, there are no longer any bodies in this cemetery. Chinese tradition at that time stated that a son or daughter of China must be buried in the land of their birth. Many Chinese arranged ahead of time that should they die here, their bodies would be disinterred and sent back to China for burial. Institutions such as the Chinese Benevolent Society would arrange such services paid for ahead of time by those to be transported. Unlike white miners, the Chinese presence on Wild Horse Creek increased with the end of the gold rush. The sight of a Chinese placer miner patiently working with his rocker box, or later with a hydraulic monitor, would have been common to many that visited Wild Horse in the years following the 1860s. The legacy of Wild Horse Creek that we have today was formed in part by the painstaking work of the Chinese miners. The poster goes on to describe a funerary custom practiced by the Chinese prospectors of Wild Horse Creek in a piece written by Mrs. Annie Yip of Fernie, British Columbia, in 1998. Qing Ming, the Chinese meal for the dead. Each year, the meal for the dead was prepared on the anniversary of a relative's death. The meal was an old Chinese tradition venerating one's ancestors. All children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren were expected to participate, forming a large group for the ceremony. The meal consisted of roasted chicken, assorted and expensive fruits, cooked pork, rice, wine or whiskey. The deceased's favorite food. The meal would be taken to the cemetery and laid out as would a regular meal. Three bowls, three glasses, and three sets of chopsticks would be set. The whole family would bow and pray to the ancestor, asking for the security of the family. Once the table was laid, the youngest child present would pick up the glass with the alcohol and pour it onto the grave, providing a drink for the ancestor. Then all present would partake in the food, assuring that the dead would not have to dine alone. This ritual was performed to assure that the dead were not hungry on the other side, and provided good fortune for all attendants. By 1865, the population of Fisherville and the surrounding area had swelled to nearly 5,000. Soon, rough women with names like Axe Handle, Bertha, Little Lou, Gunpowder, Sue, and Wildcat. Jenny began to move into town, establishing their own district called Tonyville. Another CIBC poster at the Fisherville site attempts to give readers an idea of the harsh life led by the prospectors at Wild Horse Creek. In the hills, the miners had to survive on poor rations while doing hours of tedious back-breaking work digging through rock and gravel immersed in ice-cold mountain water. There were few remedies for disease or injury, and the 19th century doctor was often of more harm than help to his patient. Few of these men actually made their fortune. Most of the gold they found went to pay the inflated prices of supplies. What they had left might be spent on a spree in the dance halls and saloons of San Francisco. These celebrations were fueled with plenty of liquor and gambling, and often ended in violence and death. And the residents of Fisherville soon discovered that the town itself was built on gold deposits. The buildings were demolished so that the ground beneath them could be relieved of its auric contents. By the end of 1865, many of the town's residents began to move on in search of brighter prospects, namely Big Bend Country to the north and Helena, Montana to the south. And as suddenly as it had boomed, Fisherville was abandoned. Despite being briefly resurrected as a Chinatown by Oriental prospectors who arrived to sift through the claims that the Americans had deserted, Fisherville was gradually devoured by the British Columbian forest. In total, an estimated 48 tons of gold was removed from the Wild Horse Creek diggings in the short-lived rush of 1864 and 65, worth about $907 million CAD in today's currency. Today, all that remains of the original Fisherville is a ruined stone chimney and a heap of hand-milled, age-silvered wooden planks, which once comprised the Kootenay Post Office, abandoned in 1888 when the government of British Columbia moved their offices to Fort Steele. Last but not least, the Fisherville Cemetery is also intact. A sign near its entrance states, In this cemetery lie the remains of a number of Wild Horse Creek's original residents. These men came from all over the world in search of fortune and faced countless hazards and hardships in the mountains of the Kootenays, 
their only reward, a lonely grave here under the windswept pines of Wild Horse Creek. Small forgotten cemeteries like this one are scattered across the West. Take a moment to reflect on the arduous lives led by the ill-fated adventurers who now lie beneath your feet and enjoy the silence of this, their final resting place, so far from home. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our website, pinesandmaples.ca, where you can find all sorts of great Canadian products.